I just want you to know that I came to the realization that Jesus Christ is who he says he is from a place of huge skepticism. Huge skepticism. But if there's one thing that I think we can all agree on, it's two plus two equals four, right? Real profound. <laughs> but two plus two equals four. And the reason that I, that, I, that I say that is because truth exists, right? Whether I believe two plus two equals five, you believe two plus two equals five, the world believes two plus two equals five, two plus two will equal four no matter what. Mathematics is set. It's embedded into the universe by God himself, right? If you ever start hearing somebody say two plus two equals five, especially if you see it like on TV from the government, it's time to move to another country. Right? <laughs> because it, things are about to get really ugly. So I say all that to say this, truth exists, right? And I'm gonna be speaking to you from a place today of Christianity and Jesus Christ being the truth, right? Jesus being who he says he is. I believe this with every fiber in my being, that Jesus Christ is the truth and Christianity is the correct worldview to see the world through. All right? If you're somebody who struggles with that and is like, I don't know, maybe all roads lead to heaven, I would suggest you take a closer look, but understand that I'm going to be preaching today from the place that Christianity is the true worldview and it is the objective worldview to see things through, all right? And uh, a book that I would suggest is The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. Um, if you could just grab that. I did like two years of research and then I stumbled across the, uh, the, the movie. There's, there's a movie about it and I was like, hey, you mean I could just watch this movie? And uh, I'm really good to go. But uh, anyway, let's get into God's word. I'm gonna be reading from the uh, iPhone version. <laughs> the, 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 iPad version. So uh, this this message, I always want to say this. This message, if you're taking notes, is titled "The Pharisee, the Tax Collector, and the Thief." All right. So we're going to be reading from Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. I'm going to read you something, and then we're going to break it down, and we're going to read some more. We're going to break it down. Because unlike most churches today, I actually like to read and preach the Word of God. I don't like to just, you know, flip one little part out and make a whole motivational speech out of it. So we're going to be reading. Hopefully you get motivated anyway. But, um, so this is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. I will explain what a Pharisee is and what a tax collector is if you guys uh, aren't aware. But before we uh, get into this, let's just say a quick little prayer. God, thank you so much for allowing us to gather here today. Thank you so much for Secret as a whole. Thank you for the Secret Service agents for putting this together. Thank you so much for allowing us to be in this space and come together. And, and you know, we, we skip out on our home churches to come here and learn. And it's just a, a truly a blessing that we work with a company that allows us to, uh, to, to gather and, uh, and come together as brothers and sisters in Christ. So... We're just praying that you speak to us through our word, through your word, and that everything that is said here today brings glory to nobody else but you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. If you don't know, Jesus likes to speak in parables a lot. It's kind of like a metaphor. He's telling you a truth hidden within a story. All right? Kind of like what we're experiencing here at the view, you know, not definitely not putting Mark on par with Jesus, but Mark's pretty good at doing the whole parable thing. So, um, starts with chapter nine. To some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, thank you that I'm not like other people robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all those who humble themselves will be exalted. So a Pharisee is 
somebody who's supposed to know God, they, this little context of the time, Jesus was a Jew, in case you didn't, didn't know that. Uh, the Jews were kind of under oppression of, of the Romans at the time, but they still had a lot of political power in their jurisdiction. And the Pharisees were this like, you know, you had the Sadducees, you had the Pharisees, there's a whole lot of C's in, in, in there, right? <laughs> so the Pharisees were like the holier than that, right? They did their best to keep the law, and their job was supposed to be to live a righteous life and teach you, as a fellow Jew, how to know God. And Jesus' issue with these people wasn't that they were teaching the Word of God. It wasn't that they were doing their best to live uh, in a, godly, a godly life. That's a good thing, to teach the Word of God and try to live a godly life. He, his issue with them was their pride. And not only his, their pride, but their hypocrisy. But the hypocrisy comes after pride because we're all hypocrites. You know, God knows that we are all hypocrites. So you're not going to go with your whole entire life not being a hypocrite. It's just the way that it is, all right? So his issue was the pride. So within this uh, parable, I think it's one of the most powerful gospel messages that you can find underlying. Because... Here you have this Pharisee who's going in there like, oh man, thank God. Thank you, God, I'm not like this person right here. You have a, you have a, come on, guys. We've done it. We've done it, okay? I've done it multiple times. You're scrolling through Instagram and you're like, thank God I'm not like that person. Scroll to the next one. Some of you even comment underneath your opinion of that person, right? So we've all done it, but this, this Pharisee and many Pharisees like this person, thought that they were in right standing with God because of how they were quote-unquote living, because of their position within the Jewish community at the time. They figured if my life is this good, like how it is, I'm, I'm the guy who gets the first seat at the table, I know the Torah, front, back, side to side, upside down, backwards, if you need me to tell you something, where something is, boom, I can snap my finger and there it is. They thought that that is what made them righteous before God. They thought that that is what would essentially get them to heaven, right? Now here you have the tax collector. If you don't know what a tax collector is back in time, we already don't like tax collectors now, but even back then, it was even worse because the tax collectors were taxing their own people, right? So they would not only tax their own people, because the Jews, as I said, they were under the Roman supervision. They had to pay taxes to the Romans, but you had a Jewish guy right in the middle taking the money from the Jews to give to the Romans. And not only did he just take the money from the Jews, but he took the money and added a little, a little cut, you know? Like, you ever been a middleman and selling something? Well, this was a middleman and taking something, all right? So... The Jews, and especially the Pharisees, hated the tax collectors. The tax collector was the worst thing that you could be in the culture at that time. The worst. Yet, Jesus said in that parable that this man, the tax collector, went home justified. Why is that? If he's doing one of the worst things, you got to understand, the Jews, God's chosen people, right? He chose to re-inherit the nations through this one little nation. So you're getting over on God's chosen people. Not only are you getting over on God's chosen people, but they're your people. That's like your brother or your sister doing you dirty every single day for your entire life. Like they come to dinner and you're like, Ugh. <laughs> So this is how tax collectors were viewed, as the worst of the worst. Why was he justified then? It's because he went in there humble. He didn't go in there saying, I'm keeping the law. He could have been keeping every single law except taxing. You know, he could have been keeping all of them. But he went in there humble saying, God, have mercy on me. Have mercy. A sinner went home justified. In that is the gospel. 
Now, before we break it all down, I want to read to you one more scripture from when Jesus was hanging on the cross. So, if you guys don't know, Jesus was crucified for our sins, right? But uh, when he was crucified, he was hung on the cross between two thieves, right? And this is a uh, this is the story about that. So Luke 23, uh, 39 through 43. It says, One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him and said, Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are all punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then Jesus said, then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So here you have two people that were condemned by the law. Condemned, one to the left, one to the right. Then you have Jesus, the God man, right in the middle. One of them saying, oh, if you, if you God, save yourself and save us. Like, not only like, oh yeah, save yourself, he's literally telling him, save us. Like, save us. Like, you're not guilty, bro, hanging on the cross right next to him. Like, you're not guilty. Save us. The other guy, on the other side, the other thief, is saying, are you crazy? To, to his homie that's on, the other, that's on the other cross. He's like, this man is innocent. We're getting what we deserve. Jesus looks at him and says, today you will be with me in paradise. He looked, that, that thief lived his whole entire life, ending him up on that cross, lived his whole entire life probably a criminal, ended up on that cross, and in a moment, in, an, in a moment, he looked and realized who was hanging on the cross next to him, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, literally in the flesh, right next to him, and said, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. He knew he was next to a king. And that's all that it took. Today you will be with me in paradise. And the other thief, thinking he's justified, next to him, not even realizing that he deserves to be on the cross, saying, oh, save us both. The Pharisee, the tax collectors, and the thieves. Inside that is the gospel. Every other worldview tells you that it is your job to get to heaven. It is your job to make it to the pearly gates. It is your job. You have to do X, Y, Z, and then maybe, maybe you'll have a chance. Clean up everything in life. Just, you know, you gotta balance the scales, okay? I can tell you this, I lived 28 years of my life, 29 years of my life in sin, absolute debauchery, I was the worst of the worst, I sold drugs, I did drugs, I was a womanizer, I was violent, angry, hated my parents, hated everybody, I walked around with a chip on my shoulder, and if you asked me why I chip on my shoulder, I would chip your jaw. That's who I was. There was no way I was gonna balance my scales. How long do I got to balance them? Is tomorrow promise? No. In a moment, in a moment, I didn't have to worry about balancing any scales. There's no scales. There is no, let's put a feather on this and see if it's lighter than your heart. There is no, uh, if, if you just, in the moment that, that, you, that you pass away to the next life, if you're in a good frequency, you're gonna make it. Every other worldview is based on works. Every single one of them says, hey, if you just 
you just really work hard, if you give to the poor, if you help other people, if you have a positive mindset, if you put good vibes into the universe, if you, you know, maybe you won't be reincarnated into a bug next time, or, you know, maybe you won't make it to hell. Like, at, at least, like, some of the religions tell you, look, you're gonna have another chance, you know, you can just, you know, come back as a bug, hop around a little less, and, you know, don't eat that person's flowers, eat some plants, and then boom, maybe you'll be a rabbit next time, right? Like, this is, all works based. Christianity is the only worldview that says there is absolutely nothing that you can do. Absolutely nothing that you can do to earn your way into the presence of an all holy God. Absolutely nothing you can do. It's been done for you on the cross. All you have to do is accept it. Those two stories, I read them with, as James says, you know, you hear something new for like the, the you hear it the millionth time and you're like, oh, that's what that is. Like I was reading it, uh, I have just been going through Luke and, and I read it with like fresh eyes uh, this last time and I had, I, I had no idea how, how the gospel was just intertwined into all of these stories that Jesus told and all of these scenarios that, that he's in from, you can even just go all the way back to the Old Testament, you know, Jonah and the fish, and like, it's just, Jesus is all the way through there, right? So, I, I don't wanna take too long, but I want you to really think about some things. What have you been trusting in? What are people around you trusting in? If we know anything, if we know anything, it's that we don't know if we'll wake up tomorrow. We go through life with the confidence that, like, yeah, I can do that tomorrow. Cool, cool, cool. Do it tomorrow. How many of you, like, whenever I played with the idea of God, I always thought, I just, I gotta get my, my life right first if I'm gonna do that whole God thing. You, your life ain't never gonna be right enough for God. You're never gonna be right enough. But, but, but God fixed that. God said, look, I know, I know, I know my people ain't never gonna earn it. Imagine, 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 like the escape plan from eternity past, like, like that he laid out for us and, and, and we're so blind to it. So I, uh, I wanna come in for a close on a few things. Now, salvation is, uh, there's, there's a quote from C.S. Lewis, and I always say it, because this is a quote that, like, uh, that got me thinking about these things. It said, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. If true, of the utmost importance. The only thing that it cannot be is moderately important. Two plus two equals four. If Christianity is true, the most important thing you can do in life is figure that out. It is, we think that, you know, these little temporary things that, that we put our faith in, you know, we, we're here for what? We're here for business, right? To grow a business. And we think that this business will save us. Temporarily, it could. It could save you from some financial disaster. It saved me from a lot of stomach issues unless I eat Sonic. <laughs> <laughs> but man, this little life of suffering is so insignificant to an eternity of joy that is promised to us through Jesus Christ. So, let me read this to you. So I am one of the people who uh, is, is like how uh, James was saying, I don't think you should listen to every preacher, right? And the reason being is I think some preachers preach a false gospel. Yeah. I remember I was going to church every single day, uh, every single day, whoa, uh, every single weekend, right? And it wasn't until an event like this till I heard the gospel. It took a sales event. <laughs> A sales event with the meeting like this for me to be like, oh, that's what it is. I had no idea. No idea. I went to church. I felt motivated. I said, yeah, I'm going to go chase my dream. 
For what? For what? It's a temporary delusion. The devil, if you don't think the devil's in church, you bug it. Right? Absolutely bug it. Salvation. This is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. This is Paul talking. Paul probably the most gangster uh, uh, apostle that existed. Right? Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you which you receive and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, as of first importance, the gospel, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believed in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I need you to focus on some things right here, right? Paul says the gospel that he preached to you. So if you ever go to a church that's preaching another gospel, it's time to run. It is time to run. If they're telling you that believe in Jesus and your whole entire life is going to be perfect, run. If they're telling you believe in Jesus and every single relationship that you have is going to work out, even the one that you live in and sin in, run. If they are preaching you a man-centered gospel that Jesus Christ is about what you can get out of it in this temporary world, it is time to run from that church. Jesus Christ mind was on eternity when he died on that cross. Does he want you to live a good life? Yeah, but he wants you to live a holy life. He wants you to live a life in right relationship with him. And when I say a holy life, I don't mean like you have to be perfect because nobody can be perfect except the God man himself, Jesus Christ. But come on, can we give it a try? choices to live differently is what got me into right standing with God. No way. I am still one of the worst people I will ever meet. If you knew what went on in my mind, man, I am one of the worst sinners ever. Ever. I sometimes look at, look at my life and I'm like, oh man, how could I be like that? And then I look in the mirror and I'm like, oh yeah. You know, you look in your past and you're like, dang, oh man, I was such an idiot. And then you look in the mirror and you're like, oh yeah, there I am. <laughs> Jesus Christ died for your sins so you could have eternal life. Eternal. How do you step into eternity in right standing with God? It is simple, okay? It's not, hey, make sure you're not going out drinking tonight. That's, that's not it. It's not, hey, I know you slept around. If you don't stop that, you're not going to heaven. That's, that's not what it is. It, we are always going to fall short. We are always going to mess up. But when you fall short, are you like, whatever, the great? <laughs> Or are you like, dang, I fell short, man. I, every day I feel like, like, oh man, that was a huge mess up right there. Like I'm just overly over and over every single day. I'm like, man, oh God, thank you. Thank you for saving a sinner like me. How do you get into heaven? How do you get into right standing with God? Because we are all going to pass into eternity from this life to the next. We, every single one of us has an eternal life ahead of us. And it's going to be in one of two places. Another thing you got to run from is churches that will not tell you where you are going if you do not put your faith in Jesus Christ. Because it is not a good place. Not a good place. But we choose to go there. You know that? How could God send us to hell? If you don't want God in this life, he's going to give you what you want in the next life. Complete separation from all that's good. Everything good comes from above. Everything good comes from God. If you want an eternity, an eternity separated from everything good, he gives you over 
Paul says it, he gave them over to themselves. In the next life, we get given over to our own desires. God's desires for us are way higher than our desires could ever be. Do I want to go crown royale 17 million times? Yeah, but I'd much rather have whatever God's got in store for me. <laughs> to close out all you have to do is stop trusting in everything else don't trust in your good works don't trust in becoming a better person don't trust in how much money you give to the poor don't trust in how much time you give to those in need all those things are good do them do them they're like filthy rats in front of an all holy God. All you have to do is accept the free gift given to you by Jesus Christ and say, you know what? I ain't even gonna try, like, to save myself. I am going to trust the finished work of Jesus Christ on that cross. I am going to say, I will never live a perfect life. I am going to accept the perfect life that Jesus life that Jesus' life was. I know that I am never going to, uh, I know that I deserve the punishment that Jesus got on that cross, and I know that I will never have to feel that punishment if I put my trust in Christ. I know that he rose on the third day because we have historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ that vastly outweighs every other conspiracy theory that somebody can come up with. This is not like other faiths where there's no historical evidence for it. Buddha wasn't written about till 400 years after he lived. Jesus, the, the, the New Testament stories came within 20 years, 30 years after his life. You know, in a place that, had, that, that lived on oral tradition, for them to even be like, you know, we should probably write this down. That's a miracle in itself. <laughs> so if you do not know where you are going, I had a, a girl that was on my team, got hit by a truck, 20 something years old, she's not on, in this company, but in, in another company, left behind two kids, gone. Tomorrow is a promise, your next breath isn't promised, nothing, it is promised to you when you are old, nothing. But to go into the next life, in the presence of an all-powerful, all-loving God, with arms wide open, all it takes <coughs> is to put your faith in Jesus Christ today. If you have not done it, do it now. I beg of you, do it now. I, I wish I could give this peace that I have to people that are going through the ups and downs of life. As I said, you know, life ain't perfect when you become a Christian, but man, there is peace. When you have that right relationship with God, you're just like, man, I'm putting all of my trust in you. I know that no matter what happens in my life, that, that you have laid the path out for me. You are sovereign and you love me as your own. And that peace, that peace, I wish I could just give it. I, I see so many of my friends and my family struggling with heartbreak. Struggle, struggling with depression, with alcoholism, with what, and, and you know, Jesus said, you know, it's not like a, like a sticker that you put on a, on a, on a well that's got a hole in it, you know, it's not like, all right, I put my trust in Jesus, boom, life is perfect, that's not how it is, but man, there is peace, there is hope, and we know that no matter what happens to us in this life, oh my gosh, in the next life is glory, glory. So, to close out, ugh, man, it's a sonic, ugh, it's a sonic. <laughs> so to close out, uh, um, this is how it is. I know that it, there's many people who, who come to these things and, and they've never put their trust in Christ. So if everybody could just like bow their bow their head and close their eyes. Also, if you could just um, sign out because I don't want to do this part on my thing. So. Uh,